Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Every few months I ask you to ask me some questions so I can answer them in a video for you. And well, this is one of these videos. In today's video I won't be answering any repeat questions to keep it interesting for regular viewers, but if your question was not answered, it's probably because I've been answering it one of my previous Q&As first. I'll link all three of them in the description below and all of my Q&A videos have chapters for each question. So you can very easily skip back and forth between just the relevant questions for you. I also classified them in three buckets, let's say. First, some general questions, then some questions more in relation to Moss Pulse and at the very end, some bread related questions because he definitely caught your attention. Yes, you did, my baby. Brett is helping me read out the questions. Thank you, Brettles. Anyway, we have a lot of questions to answer today, so let's get started. Question number one, how do I deal with pest prevention? Well, quite easy. I try and keep my plants as healthy and happy as possible. Happy and healthy plants are going to have an easier time fighting off pests themselves, or let's say they're less receptive to pests if they are happy and healthy. So really, the way I do that is, you know, obviously by taking good care of it, making sure that it always has a healthy root system, but also just keeping the leaves clean. If your leaves are clean, dust free, no cat hair on there, then your plant can optimize photosynthesis, can produce as much energy as possible. And also pests like to kind of go into the little crevices of the leaves, you know, they like to be kind of hiding under the dust and kind of be, just be nice and protected. Basically, if you have a smaller collection, I would highly recommend that you give your plants a good shower once a week. If you can put your plants out in the rain because you've got a backyard, I would totally do that. When I had a garden, when I still had a house and a garden, every, you know, if, if it happens to be rainy around about watering time, then I would just take all of the plants, I pop them in the backyard and I let the rain wash all of the leaves clean and the leaves were so, and the plants were so super, super happy and healthy with that. They love the rain. I personally have noticed way less pest issues with plants on my balcony because they are exposed to rain, wind, harsher sun and so on. So it's just not really creating a good environment for the pests to thrive in, but still a good enough environment for the plants to thrive in. Bottom line, keep your plants happy, healthy and clean. And I reckon that is the best pest prevention you can do. Question number two, could you switch homes with your current plant collection or do you think plants would suffer with changes? What would have to be perfect for you to move? Well, first of all, I'm renting, so it's probably not necessarily in my hand whether I have to move or not. The landlord can also terminate the lease. So um, it's, it might not necessarily be up to me whether I want to move or not. If it is up to me, at the moment, I have no desire to move. I think this apartment works perfectly fine for my purposes. For It's large enough for Brett, myself, and all of our plants, and we can still have somebody visiting us. Um, but it is also still small enough for me to stay on top of its maintenance. I'm a bit of a neat freak, so the more space I've got, the more I've got to clean. So um, I think this apartment serves my purposes really, really well at the moment. Now, when it comes to the actual moving part, um, I personally, when I moved here, my plant collection was much smaller. So I had an easier time. Plus, I only moved 500 meters down the road. So the conditions for the plant themselves, the environmental conditions coming in from the outside weren't all too different. The only real difference was that I have way more light exposure in here. So for my plants, it was actually a positive change. I didn't really notice any suffering. If anything, they actually started growing even more since I moved into this apartment. But the moving in itself, that was the part that I was most worried about. Damaging plants, you know, getting them through the doorways and putting them in moving trucks and so on. Once they got to the new location, if you can give it similar conditions, then I don't think you need to expect any sort of shock just because you move them. If you move them into an equally nice environment then they should just continue to grow but of course whenever there is a little bit of change there might be a little bit of shock but happy and healthy plants can also cope with that sort of stress much better than smaller unhealthy plants for example so it really also depends on the state of your collection um, at the stage of moving question number three what does a plant emergency look like for me i wouldn't say that there is such a thing as a plant emergency because plants are just a luxury item so can't really be that urgent, can't be in an emergency, right? But I suppose what you're 
asking is what would get me to the stage of freaking out. Um, I don't know. I just feel like after so many years of growing plants, I'm pretty realistic with my expectations and I know that things can go south anytime. So I'm not necessarily like freaking out, but probably the one thing that would concern me is if the newest leaf start fading or start going yellow rather than the older leaves. Like if I see a decline in the leaf health of the new leaves, then I would probably start being concerned. Yeah, I wouldn't say that it's an emergency, but that would probably be a concern for me if that's something I would notice because older leaves dying, older leaves going brown, yellow, that is totally fine. But newer leaves, they're supposed to be the fresh, beautiful, uh, you know, best looking part of the plant. Number four, do you have a wish list and what is on it? I don't have an actual physical list or digital list for that means. I do ha definitely have some plants that I know of that I wouldn't mind adding to the collection if I get my hands on them. Um, but thinking about them on the top of my head, I reckon I could just think of Anthurium Luxurians, which I wouldn't mind adding to my collection, and uh, Philodendron Illimaniae. I think those are probably the only two that I you know, I'm kind of looking out for, but I'm also not super desperate for them. I've added quite a few plants towards the back end of 2022 already. So I'm happy to, you know, grow these ones out first and then get a new round of uh, newer, smaller plants. Next question. Do you go through stages where my plants are more draining than rewarding? Um, not anymore. <laughs> I will... No, I haven't for a while, let's put it that way. Definitely, I think at the beginning, the scales can tip really quickly. If you're still new and you're still making a lot of mistakes and you're still not quite sure what's going on, you're still trying to figure it all out. Don't get me wrong, I'm still trying to figure things out right now, but I've learned a lot over the last two years, so it's way less frequent. So at the beginning, it's more frequent that you kill a plant or that you absolutely just, you just don't know what went wrong with that plant. And... Also at the beginning, you tend to blame yourself for everything that goes wrong. So if a plant is unhappy, you're just like, what did I do wrong? I mess up. I'm, I'm terrible at looking after plants, which can be very draining emotionally. So definitely back then, I mean, probably the first year of me starting my plant hobby, sometimes there were times when it was a little bit more draining just because there wasn't that much of a reward yet. But if you stick it through, um, and you make all of your lessons, you learn all of your lessons and you really perfect your craft, then eventually uh, you get so much reward that uh, for me personally, it's worth the effort that I put in. I'm a person that I like to get really good and really efficient at things. So the longer I've been doing something for, the better I get at it and the more efficient I get at it. So by now, my plant care approach, my plant routines, my watering routines, are uh, less work than they were at the very beginning, even though my plant, my, even though my collection might have tripled in size. It's just because I'm very regimented, very systematic with my approach. So it's not so draining because I have given myself a really good structure. Overall, I think it's one of the most rewarding hobbies um, I've ever had. I mean, I'm literally watching things grow. This, they, they grow. It's something that grows. Like if you, if your hobby is, let's say, like fashion, like you're not going to buy like a shirt and you put it in your wardrobe and it grows. It's going to stay that shirt. It's just going to deteriorate over time, to be honest. Plants is a hobby that you I buy plants that are tiny and then they appreciate over time. Like it's, it's really rewarding, actually. The more I think about it, the more rewarding it gets. Next question. What are your favorite vining slash climbing plants for moss poles? Well, Pretty easy answer. I have a playlist called Plant Spotlights. In that playlist, I take a specific plant and I put a spotlight on it, explain everything that I know about the plant and the journey that we've been through together and so on. Well, all of the plants that I've had for two to three years and I still decide to grow them, I still decide to take care of them. Well, I suppose those are the ones that I recommend for most poles. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it myself. So essentially just Take inspiration from the plants that you can see on my channel. Maybe have a look at my full house plant tour so you see the plants that I have chosen to grow on moss poles. What kind of plants do you think are interesting but you don't care about adding to your collection? 
First of all, disclaimer, tastes are different. Everybody has a different taste and you can grow whatever plant you want as long as it floats your boat, go for it. I can only speak from my personal taste and I like aeroids. Um, and I also think that aeroids work really well for my environment uh, and my, my care approach and so on. So I think for in an indoor setting, aeroids are a great choice. I personally like the look of orchids, of course, of, mainly it's flowers. Um, and I like some begonias. I kind of like the idea of like them being smaller, cute terrarium plants, but I have no desire to grow either of them myself. So, yeah, I think they're really interesting. And I think they're also interesting from a collector's point of view, because essentially you could never stop collecting them. There's so many different types and you can hybridize them and so on. So I think it could be a really rewarding hobby to have. It would be a very intense hobby to have like you would never stop learning but i suppose that happens with any sort of plants that you choose next question what are the best plants to keep in lower light well i feel like given i'm not a botanist or horticulturalist i i only know like a fraction of the entire plant kingdom i, I said before i'm not an expert because in the grand scheme of things i know very very little i know a little bit about aeroids and growing them indoors, which is like a niche within a niche within a niche within a niche. I'm right? so in the grand scheme of things, if we're talking about plants, full stop, I have no idea which plants are the best to grow in shady conditions. If you're asking about aeroids that can tolerate lower light conditions, I don't think I am knowledgeable enough to curate a list of plants that can do in, in, in shadier conditions. But think about it. You want to grow plants as close as possible to their natural conditions to optimize their growth. So if you look at plants that in nature would grow in more lower light conditions, then those are probably also the ones that do best in lower light condition indoors. So you don't necessarily want to go for something that is a climber because climbers climb up trees to get access to more light. So you probably want to look for more like um, terrestrial plants that kind of just grow on the forest floor and are shaded by the canopy above. So any, anything crawling, anything kind of smaller, um, you know, clumpier, any terrestrial aeroid is probably going to be better for lower light conditions. But lower light conditions does not mean darkness. Low light conditions I would classify this right here on my left. This plant, by the way, does not normally live here. I just put it here in frame to make it look nice. This over here, I would consider low light right now. I know, hard to judge because you're seeing it through a camera, but low light does not mean put a plant in your bathroom without a window. Next question. If you could make a hybrid of any two plants, which two would you choose? Wow, I really, really like that question, actually. And I'm Assuming you're asking about plant full stop, not necessarily just aeroids or within the same genus and so on. So let's, let's ignore all sorts of rules around what can actually hybridize with what and assume that any plant could make a hybrid with any other plant. I think it would be nice to have like a maple tree with varicose leaves. Imagine, imagine like you have like a maple tree in the maple leaves but the leaves are kind of velvet and look like a varicosum. Like imagine this banana crossed with a varicosum. Like they're already quite similar, the green and red colors. Like imagine it has like a fuzzy stem and then like velvet leaves and like veining. I don't know. I think anything crossed with a varicosum, I think I would go around and cross le legitimately every single plant in the world with a varicosum and see what it looks like. Imagine they're coasting with fenestrations. Oh. Anyway, yeah, I think I would, I, I don't know the second one necessarily for sure, but I know that one of the parents would definitely be philodendron Verkhoisen. Next question. What are your thoughts if people tell me they got a plant because they saw me talking about it in one of my videos? I really like that. The reason why I have this YouTube channel is to share my experiences and hopefully inspire and motivate others to also pick up this hobby or to get better at this hobby or do you know to take this hobby to the next level. So if people look at my videos and they feel inspired and motivated or even encouraged to grow a certain plant because I'm giving them the confidence that 
they'll be able to look after that plant with my assistance or, you know, based on my experiences, they feel like they will be able to look after that plant. That is extremely rewarding for me. That is exactly what I'm doing all of this for. So I love that. If you're telling me that you only got a plant because I got the plant and because you think that now it's like cool to have this plant, but you don't even like it, then that's probably a bit silly. But look, each to their own. Why you get a certain plant and what plant you get doesn't really matter as long as you're okay with it. Next question. Is it possible to grow plants this big in a drier climate? Um, probably, but probably not those specific plants. You would need to look for plants that are more suitable to a drier climate. So probably not tropical rainforest plants. But yeah, of course, you can definitely grow plants to like, I mean, there's trees that grow all over the world and they're large. So yes, plants can grow large in drier climates. It just depends on the plant. If we're talking about aeroids, then you probably want to stay away from anything velvety. You might want to stay away from anything anthurium, but there are some anthuriums that can handle lower uh, humidities as well. You probably want to focus on pothos. Pothos and some monstera can handle lower humidities um, as well. But you got to be realistic. If you give plants suboptimal conditions, you cannot expect optimal growth. Next question. And I had to kind of paraphrase that a little bit. It was a bit lengthier, but I've gotten that question many times over the years. Can plant XYZ grow large or can plant XYZ size up even more? I have no idea. Again, I know very little in the grand scheme of things. I can only speak about the plants that I have grown myself in my environment and that I managed to grow to a decent size. There are plants that I wasn't able to manage to grow to a decent size, like the Monstera Peru, for example, but that could also be me and not the plant. Um, ultimately, I think to find out how large a certain plant can grow Trial and error is definitely an approach, but I would, I would just Google. I would probably just search for it on Instagram as well for the hashtag and see how large other people have grown a certain plant and then base it off of that. If it's then realistic for that to happen indoors and with whatever conditions you've got available, that's another question. I do definitely believe that plants indoors won't ever have the same potential to size up as they would have um, in nature but you can always try next question are you planning to downsize to make room for more coveted plants well first of all i think my plants are coveted enough already i think any plant that you like is a coveted plant by you right so i but i'm assuming you're trying to say that Am I going to get rid of some of my basic plants to make room for rare plants instead? Absolutely not. I grow plants based on their looks and not based on their status in society or based on their status in the plant community and the price tag that was attached to it. If I like the look of a plant, like my Adansonia, for example, one of my all-time favorites, it's so basic. Like you can get an Adansonia at any any store. Even the supermarket has Adansonias now. So no, I'm definitely not going to get rid of it to make room for an uh, anxiety-inducing, way too expensive plant that is probably not even going to be that happy with my environment. But I am definitely trying to downsize. So I am definitely considering certain plants like Ade Sparking Joy for me uh, is the... Is the effort worth the reward? Is that, you know, do I enjoy this plant? But that has nothing to do with the price tag necessarily. There could be two completely different things. There are plants that might not spark me any joy because it was too expensive and I feel like it's not worth it, you know? So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. When you water your plants, does it matter if any of the water that has liquid fertilizer on it? get in touch with the leaves. In my experience, no. It definitely has happened plenty of times where I'm spraying the moss pole with some water that had, has fertilizer in it. And of course, with splashback and so on, it goes everywhere. Realistically, I have definitely washed the leaves with water that had fertilizer in it. Not purposely, it was just that was in the spray bottle and I needed to spray. 
Um, so from my experience with my GT foliage focus liquid fertilizer that I use, I haven't had any issues, but I also use a very weak dilution and my plants don't get direct sunlight. If you use a strong dilution and you do it in the middle of the day in summer, 40 degrees, and the leaves are exposed to full sun, then maybe the minerals inside the water could burn the leaves. The leaves would probably burn even without fertilizer in it with those conditions. So from my experience, no, I haven't seen any damage based on liquid fertilizer being in the water that I spray my leaves with. But if you're worried about it, then I would avoid it where, where possible. But I don't think you need to stress. Leaves open up with scars and markings. How can you avoid that? Well, there can be many, many reasons for scars and marking. First of all, it could be a sign of pests. If you see almost like little, it's almost like something right down a sleigh on your leaf, that could be thrips. It's almost like they slide down your leaf and eat everything in their path. So that explanation made no sense. Anyway, so markings on leaves can be due to pest issues. Uh, specifically, if the leaf is small and then pests start sucking on it, if the leaf then starts expanding, these little spots where the plant, where the insects have sucked on can then become kind of like scar tissue and kind of make the leaf D-shaped and so on as well. Second of all, it could just be mechanical damage. So it could be that while it was unfurling, it was kind of brushing against a wall or brushing against the moss pole or brushing against another leaf, um, something like that. So that happens all the time. And really the only way to prevent it is, well, give your plant as much room as possible surrounding it. But that is really hard once, you start, once your collection starts expanding and there's just leaves everywhere. Also, sometimes I swear to God that I do nothing with that leaf. I don't touch it. The leaf doesn't touch anything else. And you still get some sort of markings, which I believe could just be a result of inconsistent watering, inconsistent humidity while the leaf was growing up. When the leaves are still small and just pushing out, they're super, super soft, super vulnerable. So any sort of little, any sort of touch, any marking, but also any sort of inconsistency in water supply could cause certain tissues to you know, form scars or markings or whatever we want to call that. So I think there could be multiple reasons as to why that happens. I don't think it is necessarily something that you can avoid at all costs. And also I think it's something that we just need to normalize. They are leaves, they are nature. If you want perfect leaves, you're probably better off getting a fake plant. Nature has its faults, right? Nature has like, there are brown spots on my leaves. You might not see it all the time because you're watching it through social media you're seeing a two meter tall plant in a tiny window like that. Of course, you're not going to see every little mark on every single leaf. There's so much happening in my videos that you can't focus on the imperfections. But that's the, that's the point. It's like if you don't focus on the imperfections, the plant is actually perfect. If you just focus on every little mark and you beat yourself up about it, then you're probably going to have a hard time looking after plants. But yeah, it's also something that I learned over time. At the beginning, I was aiming for the perfect leaf. And then when like something happened to that leaf, I was so disappointed. I'd be like, oh my God, now I need to wait another two months for the next perfect leaf. And it's like, the perfect leaf will never come. Trust me. What features make you most drawn to a plant so that you decide to buy them? Well, there's a few. I definitely like velvet texture. I like fenestrations. I like size. I like color. So I like anything with red, for example. I think that is always really sexy. And I like anything dark. But I think the single most thing that I'm attracted to in plants is probably when I like veining. Mm. So heaps. Um, so the single most thing I love in a plant is probably velvet texture. I, oh, super hard to beat a velvet leaf. Um, Variegation can be nice as well, but it's not like the most thing I look forward to. Like I think sometimes variegation can also look a bit odd. It doesn't always look nice. So I think definitely velvet it, to me is like a safe bet. Like a velvet plant is always going to look nice. But also I look at growth pattern. There are just certain plants I just cannot deal with their growth pattern. Uh, that's something I really dislike about crawling plants. Well, I like the leaves and they can size up nicely. And, you know, we have like Gloriosum with beautiful velvet leaves. I really dislike the growth, like the, the crawling growth pattern. I like climbers. And something else I'm really drawn to in a plant that makes me really want to buy it is if it goes through a transformation 
from juvenile to mature. I love setting myself a challenge, getting a juvenile plan, and then ending up with a mature plan that looks nothing like the juvenile plan. That sort of transformation, like that gets me excited. That keeps me excited about this hobby as well. All right, next question, let me read this one out. While most men are so inclined into sports, why do you think most men now grow interest into plants and gardening? Well, okay, let me rephrase this question because I do not understand what your gender has to do with your hobby. Those are two unrelated things. It's 2023. We can all have whatever hobby we want. I mean, it's an odd one to answer because the question itself is kind of almost sexist because it implies that, well, real men do sports. What happened that they suddenly do, that they suddenly grow plants, right? Still, thanks for asking a question. And I assume there was no harm intended, but still these sort of unconscious biases that we keep throwing around, they're going to set the standard in society. And if we don't change that, then, you know, there will be future generations that still grow up with the same stupid bias, thinking that men need to be manly and do sports and go to the pub and get drunk and fight on the streets and women going to be in the kitchen looking after the kids and the plants, right? But overall, I suppose there is a trend of more people growing plants, not just men, just more people getting involved in the plant hobby, right? I mean, it's been a massive trend on social media for, for years now. Um, and I would say that probably the reason for that is that people... More and more people, you know, obviously people live in cities, people are getting less and less connected to nature. So I think houseplants are a great way for people to reconnect with nature a little bit. I personally also think it's a great way for people to learn how to nurture something, to be consistent, to take accountability, to, count res to take responsibility. We're seeing a lot of younger generations deciding to actually have plants over pets or over children because they are less of a responsibility, but still you still take on somewhat of a responsibility. I love the next question. What are the most affordable rare house plants? That is an oxymoron in a sentence. Pr plant pricing is always based on demand and supply. If we are assuming that rare is an indication of it being in very, very limited supply, then I suppose the most affordable rare plants would be the ones that are not in demand. Good luck finding one of those, given that it's a bit of a rare houseplant trend going on uh, online over the last few years. I suppose what's really wrong here is the label rare. I mean, I went to Woolies the other day, and in case you don't know, Woolies is basically like where you buy everything in Australia. You go to Woolies and Bunnings and you got, you're covered. Um, so Woolies is where you buy your groceries, your your household items. At the cash out, they also have like, they always have some cute little plants there. And they're now selling philodendron gloriosum and they have a little sign on them saying, I'm rare. And it's like, how, uh, how can you be in every Woolies across the country and be sold for 15 bucks because you're tissue cultured and lychee produced in the thousands and be rare? Like if you, if there's a large supply of a specific plant, it's not considered rare, is it? And if there's not a large supply of plants, then it's probably in really high demand because there's just so many people that they don't have it yet. I don't think it's necessarily the right approach to try and look for the most affordable rare plant. Why don't you just look for the most affordable plant that you like and get that one? Like a plant is not any more desirable because a company has decided to put the label rare on it. Probably a marketing scheme. Next question. Do you think you'll ever get tired of the plants you grow? Mainly aeroids and not in the burnout sense, but more in the seen it all kind of sense. Um, I'm, I'm definitely a very ambitious person. I like to set challenges. I like to achieve certain goals. I mean, the, as soon as you achieve a goal, the goalpost keeps moving though. So at, for now, um, after three years of growing aeroids, I still have plenty of motivation and I don't think I'm getting bored of it. I think also 
doing the plant thing in combination with content creation there's like a second aspect to the whole plant hobby that also keeps it interesting and challenging right like i mean i'm um, i pretty much got my care approach for my plants down pack so the challenge now really sits in how do i bring that across to you how do i teach you certain concepts and so on how do i translate something that i learned over years into a, a video that actually is of value to you so that's where my current challenge sits and then let's see where the next challenge comes up where my next goal post is going to be moved to and so on so at this stage no but is that eventually going to happen in the future probably La uh, next question something that is seemingly lacking in the plant community right now what would it be I mean, I feel like I don't interact with the plant community that much. I have a few really close plant friends, and those are the ones that I'm in contact with. And the reason why I'm in contact with them is because we share the same values. So those are people that I get along with. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in touch with them, right? Um, but of course, I get exposed to a large portion of the plant community online because I'm posting myself and I'm putting myself out there. And I suppose what's lacking is that some people don't understand that just because I put myself out there, that you have a free pass to criticize everything that I do or my every single move. That is not at all what this is all about, is I'm putting out some content for the people that want to listen to my experiences and want to come along on this journey with me. Nobody is forced to watch my content. Nobody's forced to subscribe or follow me. So I don't understand how people rather write like a freaking one page essay about how much they dislike me instead of just clicking off my video. That is unacceptable. And that is definitely something that's lacking in the plant community. Just courtesy, just manners, like ask, saying please, saying thank you. Those things, they're definitely lacking. You know, they're, they're, people are so demanding. People want, 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 want things from me but they can't even give anything back. They can't even watch my video. Like I'm putting hours worth of effort into recording a video to answer any, to answer your questions. People get angry at me because they have to watch my video to get the answer to their question and they're demanding me to message it to them instead. I'm like, wow, you want something from me, not the other way around. Like how can you want something from me, but I'm not willing to give anything in return. And I'm, not asking for your money, right? Like I'm definitely, I'm not a person that's like, oh my God, you need to pay me to watch my content. I put out all of this content for free. The only thing you need to do is to watch my content. The only thing that I ask you to do to support me is watch my content, engage with my content. Please share my content with your friends and family so that I can reach larger audiences. That's all I'm asking you to do, which is free. You need to maybe spend your time on it. But again, you volunteer to spend your time on this. You don't have to watch my content. But if you're not willing to watch my content, if you're not willing to take advantage of the content that I have already put out there that might answer all of your questions, you cannot get angry at me for not helping you. You didn't help yourself. I gave you all of the resources to help yourself and you have decided to not do it. And instead, you have decided to slide in my DMs and harass me for not spoon feeding you answers so that is just not okay and will always 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 result in you being blocked there's just absolutely no excuse for that and i won't tolerate any of that that i'm just a person i'm doing this in my free time for free for you guys and i just don't need to deal with any of that shit honestly it's nah, not happening not happy not happy jane Anyway, sorry, that got me like, whew, worked up. Okay, next question. What's your thought on self-watering moss poles? And there was a little bit more to that question. Basically, they were explaining that they have their moss poles outside. They dry out quite quickly and they have a, a bucket of water standing up behind but above the moss pole and then like a little wicking piece of fabric to go from the bucket into the moss pole and then the moss pole just slowly starts wicking up the water. That sounds like it definitely works, but that sounds incredibly unrealistic with 30, 40, 50 poles in an indoor environment. I mean, unless you love having buckets standing and hanging all around your apartment, I think that would, for me, 
I grow my plants for aesthetic purposes. I want them to look nice. I want them to be displayed in a nice way that adds to the interior design of my apartment. I like them to be statement pieces. And I feel like having buckets hanging everywhere, left, right, and center would kind of take away from it. But from a functionality perspective, yeah, totally. So up to you if that is something that you're willing to do or not. I personally don't see how it could get any more. I mean, you still need to top up the bucket with water. So the effort it takes to top up the bucket with water, wouldn't it be the same to just take the water bottle and flip it upside down on the moss pole? Same, same, right? You need to be there and do the watering thing. So if it's in a bucket or in a bottle, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much more self-watering than literally putting a bottle upside down can be. Um, but yeah, each to their own. But technically, yeah, you're right. From a physical, from a physics perspective, it should totally work. Next question: How come your epipremnum got root rot, even though you water the pole and not the mix? Blah 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 blah. I've actually had this question a few times. So basically, if you're not, if you don't know what happened, it, there's I uploaded a video the other day. There was a plant that had root rot, and I kind of rescued it, or basically it was saved by the roots within the moss pole, and now it's happy again. But people were basically saying that, well, hang on, how come your plant had root rot? If you're following your own advice, shouldn't that technically be impossible, right? You're going on about the moss pole and the air and the a chunky aeroid mix and so on. Um, so basically, people are implying that my advice is incorrect because, well, there's a plant that suffered despite the fact that I took care of it. I mean, you can't judge somebody by the plant that has done the worst if there is 50 plants around them that are thriving. So they are plants, they are nature, they are not always predictable. Things can go wrong. There's human error involved. I still need to constantly water that plant and apply the principles. It's totally normal for me to also forget about that one time or every now and then, right? I could totally water a plant and way too much water is accumulating in the planter and I just forget to empty it. I forgot that I watered it. I have so many plants. Like, it's hard to keep on top of that. That doesn't make any of the advice that I have given previously void. So don't see this as black and white. Everything in life is pretty much a spectrum. So you can't... That's actually, I should have said that to the what's wrong with the plant community, black and white. There are, there's so much flexibility. There's so much freedom. There's so much give you know, it's plants. It's not rocket science. You're not trying to literally build a rocket to go to the moon. Like even building a rocket to go to the moon, there's probably thousands of ways to do that. So why wouldn't there be a thousand ways to grow a certain plant? So don't see everything so black and white and don't be discouraged by one negative result if everything else is positive, right? Next question, how do you come up with the idea of chop and extending? I didn't come up with that. People have been propagating plants for centuries. Uh, I personally have seen that specific approach for the first time from Craig Miller Randall on Instagram. He did it slightly differently. He didn't necessarily do the chop and extend in the way that I do it now. He was more explaining it that if you have a plant and it drops all of the bottom leaves and it looks a bit leggy. You can just chop it, take the top part. He then actually continued to propagate it in moss before he potted it up. Um, and then I kind of liked that idea and I figured, actually, I feel like you don't need to further propagate it because it would already be propagated based on it growing on the moss pole. So let's skip the propagation step and let's just pot it up straight away. Trial and error. Let's see if it works. And then it slowly turned into, let's just make this a consistent thing, always with 90 centimeter increments to actually get my plants to mature and to actually continuously grow them. So I took the same concept. I just kind of applied them to like this endless moss pole, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it is definite. Like I did not invent moss poles. I did not invent chop and extend. I did not invent growing aeroids. Like all of this stuff. I'm, I was just inspired by other people online in the way that you hopefully now might be inspired by me growing these plants. And then hopefully you can inspire somebody else to also grow these plants, right? That's life. That's beautiful. I really love that. But I have to give credit where credit is due. These, this is not my invention like these are all concepts that have been around for centuries 
I just put a name to it. I just called it Chop and Extend. And I suppose what I've done is I've just been really, really vocal online about it. Um, often what I've noticed when I first started my plant hobby, a lot of people were very cagey with their care tips or with their care approach, specifically the ones that are growing plants really, really well, right? Like everybody is happy to go to Bunnings, read out that label in front of the camera, put this in bright indirect light, which is just so useless. Everybody could just go to Bunnings and read it themselves. You're not actually giving anybody any assistance, but the people that have actually had the experience in growing plants that have had success in growing plants, I found those to be fairly cagey with their secrets and with their approaches. Um, so I suppose that's kind of like the little gap that I saw in the market. And I was like, well, why is, why is everybody doing it, but nobody talking about it? So yeah, um, or at least not to that extent. So yeah, it's a good time to get started. There's so much information out there by so many incredible plant people online. So it's a great time to, to be in this hobby or to even start this hobby. Um, next question, would you consider changing your moss poles in the future into the plastic backed ones? Actually, there is a video coming very soon where I am converting an existing moss pole to a grow vertical moss pole with the plastic backing. So that's going live, hopefully at the end of uh, January. So just stay tuned for that video. But to answer your actual question, would I do that to my entire collection? Probably not. I have way too many plants to do that in the first place. And then second of all, I have an issue with the plastic. Like I have an issue with like it from a functionality perspective, absolutely love it. It's great. And that's why I have chosen to convert some of my plants, the ones that I want to see mature even further. But I would kind of hate the idea of just having 30, 40 plastic towers all over my apartment. I feel like that would be ugly next question have you ever tried making moss poles with the support stake on the inside rather than the outside actually i have that was my very first few chop and extends i basically took the support stake i chucked it in the moss pole and then i put the other moss pole on top now you need to kind of construct the moss pole with that in mind otherwise you're just going to push all the moss out of the moss pole so you kind of need to make the moss pole with an empty little core for the garden stake to later uh, on to go into um, worked fine, definitely looked nicer because you don't have the garden stake sticking out at the back end of your moss pole, but it was a pain later on when you do chop and extends and also the roots were kind of getting tangled up with the stake on the inside. And then it was, yeah, it was from a functionality perspective, just not that nice. It was really hard to actually do the chop and extend with that method as well. And then once I started putting the stake on the outside, it was just so much easier. Okay, what do you do once the plant reaches the top of the moss pole and you don't want to chop and extend the pole? Do you recommend air layering? I feel like the entire purpose of growing your plants on moss poles is so that you can do the chop and extend and continue growing it. So I feel like if you're not willing to do a chop and extend, maybe the, end, the whole effort of making moss poles, keeping the moss pole moist and so on is almost like wasted. Every single node on your moss pole is already air layered. So you wouldn't really have to air layer it on top of that because you already have it. So if you really don't want to do a full chop and extend, I suppose what happens is your plant will start growing off of the moss pole and then any node that grows off of the moss pole, you could air layer that node once you see the air layering was successful, you can chop it, you can put it back into the base of the pole. But you're basically just going to end up with like a moss pole that the leaves on that moss pole is gradually going to get older and older and older and older. And it's going to start dropping the leaves at the bottom until you're only left with plants at the top. So at the latest, then you would do the chop and extend, or you would continuously have to put smaller cuttings back into the pot let them grow up again and again and again. But if you're doing that, then a chopping extent would have just given you a much better result, much quicker and easier. So yeah, I don't know. I'm a bit confused by the question because I feel like it misses the entire point of the moss pole. But yeah, if you don't want to chop and extend your moss pole, then your plant is just going to grow off the moss pole and it's going to stop maturing. It's going to go back in size. But yes, you could air layer it to then chop it. 
What are your opinions on pricing plans? What should make something more valuable or less valuable? How much should a cutting differ from the price of a whole plant? I have been very vocal on this channel that I don't enjoy talking about pricing and money. And in my last video, I already spoke way too much about it. So all I can say about this question is demand and supply. It's a very basic economic principle that also applies to plants. You can put the biggest bloody price tag on a plant. If there is nobody to buy it, then that is not what it's worth, right? If there is somebody willing to buy a plant for a ridiculous price tag, then you could argue, well, that is technically now its worth based on demand and supply. So it all depends on demand and supply. Demand and supply is very different in different countries of this world. So it's very, very hard to make any sort of judgment about plant pricing. Ultimately, your money, you need to feel comfortable with the money that you spend on your hobby. Do you generally upsize your pot from a 14 centimeter to a 20 centimeter once a pole extension is required? Yes. If the roots of your billy are growing out the top of the moss pole, how can you extend the moss pole? I understand that the billy is a slow climber, so it will take a while for the plant to reach the top of the moss pole, but by then it seems there would be very long roots coming out from the top. I love that idea. Like, imagine, you know, these little. Like uh, imagine, imagine you just have your moss pond that's just like, it's like, almost like a little ponytail, like roots just hanging out the sides. That would be funny. Realistically, once the root reaches the top of the moss pole and there's no more moss and it's starting to be exposed to the air, the root stops growing. Roots seek moisture. So it's not going to grow upwards into the air where there's no support for the root and no moisture. So it actually just stops. So for example, my Ataba I think there's like five or six roots uh, sticking out the top now but as soon as they get exposed to the air that's it they don't they don't grow anymore so i could easily just chop uh, just put an extension on it and then they'll keep growing again because they root seek moisture they'll find the moisture in the moss pole and they'll keep growing up once you put the extension on it so no need to worry about this um alrighty and lastly some brettles question brettles now it's all about you are you happy for me to disclose Yes. Okay. So people want to know a little bit more about bread, how it came into my life. If there's like some sort of cute story, well, you got to be the judge if it, the story is cute or not. One day I did decide that I just wanted to get cats. Um, it, I was always a big dog person. I still am a big dog person, but based on my lifestyle, a dog is just way too much work. I just can't, I just don't have time to take care of a dog uh, full time and it would just not be fair for the dog. I just don't have enough time to go walk, walk the dog and so on. So I was like, I want to have a cat. Of course, I wanted to adopt a cat first and foremost, and I really wanted the cat to be ginger. So as so I went on Gumtree, Gumtree, I think it's like Craigslist where you just post things. You're like, hey, I've got like furniture to sale. For uh, kind of like furniture for sale or like oh I have like this old toaster do you want it like Facebook Marketplace basically and um, so uh, Gumtree um, and I saw this ad and it was written from the perspective of the cat and it was like hey my name is Jasper my mom was a rescue and overnight she gave birth to me and my three siblings blah blah, blah. it was basically it was like super super cute written by the foster parents in the um you know it basically from the cat's point of view which i found so nice and also showed me that these foster parents you know are really good people and like really take good care of these cats and you know they so they they found brad's mom on the street and then they took her in and then overnight she gave birth to four of them now, I originally went there because I wanted to adopt the ginger cat. His name was Jasper. And um, when I got there, the foster parents were basically saying that Jasper and his brother Treacle, Treacle, I think, yeah, Jasper and his brother Treacle um, are kind of inseparable. They eat from the same bowl, they do everything together, and so on. So I figured, well, if I have one cat or two, it's kind of going to be the same work, right? Same, like, doesn't make too much of a difference. So I got them both. And Jasper 
uh, with Max and Treacle is now called Brad. So I originally actually didn't want to adopt Brad. I wanted to adopt his brother. Brad just came as a package deal with his brother. Unfortunately, his brother passed away. Um, uh, he was involved in a car accident. Uh, that was a long time ago already. I think he was only just over one and a half years old when it happened. And Brad is now five. So we spent more time just the two of us than we've had with all three of us, which is a little bit sad. Um, but Brad has actually coped with the loss quite well. I think when they were babies and teenagers, they were like inseparable. But as soon as they started becoming a little bit older, they were obviously always close and always playing with each other, but they were definitely being a little bit more independent. So I think when Max did pass away, it wasn't like Brad didn't seem too upset about it. I mean, I don't know. I was, I think I was more upset than Brad for sure. That definitely also taught me a lesson. I, that's why I do not let Brad outside anymore. All cats are also a uh, threat to the native animals here in Australia. So there's many reasons why Brad should not be outside. So he is now an indoor cat and he also seems to be okay with that. I mean, he is blessed to have his own private little jungle. So despite living indoors, he's always surrounded by plants. So yeah, somebody asked if I would consider giving Brad another cat mate. Now I have been thinking about it for sure. I think the apartment is maybe a little bit too small to have a second cat. If I would be living in a larger place, I would definitely get cats. I set my per I set myself a personal limit of seven. So if I ever have enough room to have seven cats, I will totally get seven cats. And given the size of this apartment and given how filled it is with plants already, I think a second cat would be a little bit chaotic potentially. I don't necessarily know how Brad would react to a second cat. I'm sure he would eventually warm up, but he is definitely king, right? Like he is definitely the king of the castle. So that second cat would have to be happy with that. And the other question is how do I get Brad to not destroy my plants? I do nothing. That is just Brad's personality. He's just not really interested. I don't believe you can actually train your cats to do this or not do it and so on. I don't think cats can be domestic. I don't think cats can be domesticated in the way that you would train a dog to do or not do something. They are not like that. <laughs> they have their own mind. So if a cat really wants to go ham on your plants, I feel like there's very little you can do about it apart from separating those two, right? Put the plants all in a room that the cat does not have access to. So I feel like I just got really lucky with, with, with bread, right? But I know that there's a lot of plant per people that have cats out there and the cats don't seem to be playing with the plants. The plants are also toxic to them, right? So it's not just that I don't want him to play with them because I don't want him to destroy my plants. I'm mainly worried about him. Now, when I had Max and Brad, Max was not at all like Brad. Completely different personality and Max would go crazy at every plant. So I could never bring any plants home because Max would always start eating them. And I know that they're toxic, so I didn't want, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to poison my cats. So I was really only able to start having plants indoors when Max passed away, which is the only positive thing about his passing, to be honest. But yeah, so I think really, you know, if there's a cat and the cat, you can't keep your cat off your plants, I don't think there's necessarily something you can do. Maybe somebody else has had experience with that and can share some of their experience in the comments below. That would be great. But from my personal experience, I reckon you just got to be lucky. It's just in the cat's personality or not could be an age thing as well definitely when they're kittens they're just way more playful and they want to play with everything and explore everything Brett is five years old now he is definitely a relaxed mature boy and last question can you tell us how it is like with so many plants and a cat yes i can tell you that it is amazing all right that was much much longer than i expected i feel like i haven't done a q a in a long time so i just got really excited and i definitely overshared probably a bit so i still hope you enjoyed this and if you don't want to watch the full video i am not offended at all that's why i put the chapters in the description 
So you can just skip to the questions that are interesting to you or things that you want to learn about. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I'll leave some more informative videos in the description for you as well. So if you want to learn more about moss poles, extending moss poles, aeroid mix, um, bordering moss poles, I'll leave in-depth videos in the description box for you to check out. And I will link my previous Q&A right here for you to check out. So if your question wasn't answered in this one, chances are that you'll find your answer in one of the other ones. Again, thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe and leave a nice comment and I'll see you next time. Bye.